So I have the pleasure of introducing Rosemary Collard from Concordia in Montreal, who's physically in Vancouver Island, and she's going to tell us about the letter W for wild. Hi, everybody. Um, it's great to be here. Thanks, Evan. Um, uh, I guess I would just start by saying, maybe explaining how I came to the idea of wildness and thinking about wildness. Um, and I, I think it probably happened um, midway through my field research a few years ago on the exotic pet trade. Uh, and that, that work was part of my PhD at the University of British Columbia in geography. Um, and it involved trying to essentially track how an animal is captured from the forest or the desert and transformed into a commodity that can be bought and sold halfway around the world. So I really wanted to look at the different stages that that sort of animal slash commodity life went through. Um, I looked at capturing the capture of animals, their exchange at exotic animal auctions, their use in the film industry, and then finally what brought me to the idea of wildness was working at a wildlife rehabilitation center in Guatemala, um, which basically takes in former exotic pets that haven't left their country of origin, in this case Guatemala, and because of that they're eligible for being rehabilitated and released back into the forest. Um, so I spent 30 days working at Arcus, a wildlife rehabilitation center in northern Guatemala. Uh, I mainly worked with um, monkeys, parrots, uh, but also um, all sorts of reptiles, snakes, um, other birds, um, but the, the most interesting case in a way was looking, was working with the monkeys. Um, so the basic idea of uh, rehabilitation is most of the monkeys arrive at Arcus as babies, uh, which is when animals are generally captured for the pet trade. And at that stage, the monkeys need a lot of sort of contact with, a, with, with what the center calls a surrogate parent. And so, um, oh, Sorry, I have to interrupt myself for one second. I just noticed I didn't plug my computer in. <laughs> Technology! I thought I was all prepared. The technical is, is <laughs> my crashing. My computer just watched at me telling me I have a low battery. One second. Okay, I'm back. Um, <laughs> back at Arcus, uh, the young monkeys are sort of cuddled and um, they exist in a very close relationship with a surrogate parent for one or two years before they're separated from the human and at that point a sort of extended program of dehumanization begins and so for the first year there's just no human contact but eventually they graduate to a larger cage and at that point um, humans who are their caretakers which I was one are encouraged to act very aggressively to the monkeys to sort of um, spray them if they come near the human, like if they come near you as a human, uh, yell at them, uh, stand tall, um, that sort of thing. Eventually, the monkeys are moved into a larger enclosure where they're exposed to firecrackers and blanks are shot at them, fences are electrified, and this whole, I, the whole sort of rationale behind this is that um, animals who monkeys especially who are not afraid of humans are at risk of death or recapture once they're released. And for Arcus, uh, a captive life is preferable to a death outside the cage. And I started thinking about, um, I mean, very easy to critique a center like Arcus on the basis that it is sort of reinstituting the human animal or nature culture dualism that theorists have critiqued justifiably for the last couple of decades. Um, Arcus is trying to create this sort of ideal animal out there distant from humans, maybe never crossing path with humans, and it does this through a really sort of what I call misanthropic practices of dehumanizing the animal. Um, and at the same time trying to rebuild strategies for the animal to survive in the wild, um, like forming a troop for the monkeys and um, eating sort of foods that, it, that monkeys would normally eat. Um, but in my analysis and in my time at Arcus, I, it, it wasn't quite satisfying enough for me to critique the process on the basis of the creation of a first nature, or, or that it reinstitutes the culture nature dualism. Because the, if you're trying to advocate for the health and well being of these animals, then you need sort of what I started to come to think of as a post wilderness concept of wildness. Um, thinking about what animals' sort of spatial requirements might be, what their subjective requirements are, 
um, outside of enclosures. So how um, what it what it ultimately finally amounted to was a struggle to think through um, issues of animals' spatial requirements in terms of distance, um, animals' subjective differences. How to think how to recognize those in a world that is inescapably entangled. Um, so that was sort of my theoretical and I guess political ethical project. Um, where that's landed me now, I don't know if I have a couple more minutes to sure. to see Evan. Yeah, um, definitely. So, oddly enough, I I mean, like I said, this research happened a couple of years ago, but I'm still writing it up. Um, but I just arrived in uh, on Vancouver Island yesterday. Um, I live right now out where my, my parents live and where I grew up. Um, it's called Otter Point. It's just past Souk on the southern tip of Vancouver Island. Not typically a place that's a hubbub of exotic pet activity. Um, but the day that I arrived, um, a woman happened to snap a photo of what she thought was a cougar. And uh, I went and looked at the photo, which was posted near the community mailboxes, and very quickly realized it wasn't a cougar. Um, I had studied cougars for my master's, so I was like, not a cougar, and actually looks a lot like a serval, which is a medium-sized African wildcat that I had seen frequently auctioned off um, in the U.S. at the exotic animal auctions that I attended. So I felt quite satisfied in that moment. It might have been the first time that I found a practical use for my research. Not a cougar and a serval. Um, but it turned out <laughs> um, a woman on Vancouver, like in the neighborhood actually, had been keeping this serval as a pet. And it escaped in the summer. And it's a bit unclear now whether it's been on its own since then or if it was recaptured and then has escaped again. Um, but either way, I mean, this is the photo that opens up my W for Wild entry. It was a very ser serendipitous sort of uh, coincidence that um, the serval is wandering around right now as we speak at a former exotic pet that is sort of rewilding itself. Um, not without risks, of course. I mean, it's it's at the same time it's putting people's pets at risk and chickens. The, the lot of there are a lot of small farms around here, so uh, not a, not an easy question or an ethical equation by any means, but um, yeah, kind of an interesting backdrop for, for this conversation. So, so what I really like about your notion of wildness is that it gives space for the autonomy and alterity of other species um, that have social, ecological um, uh, communities that might or might not involve humans. It, it sort of it, it enables us to think about these contact zones where um, people and other species long separated by geography or history or circumstance are coming together to interact and, and surprising things emerge in these contact zones. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about instances where you've seen these overlapping social and ecological networks and, and some of the dynamics of wildness that take place in, in those zones of contact. Hmm. Oh, that's, a, that's actually quite a complicated question. Um, <laughs> Because there's so many different ways that wildness can be expressed. And um, so I, I, I guess my most immediate contact zones with these sort of animals that are partially wild or in the, in the middle of being rewilded is at Arcus, where I, when I was working with monkeys in the cage. Um, they... And I and I think I think it's really helpful to think of that space as a contact zone in the in the very way that Mary Louise Pratt does. And this is a reason why I've been brought to anthropology in some ways, um, because the multi-species ethno ethnographers are obviously thinking about this in such productive ways. Um, but to think about these sort of interactions in the contact zone as mutually constitutive through radically asymmetrical relations of power. So um, it was a in an inescapable aspect of interacting with these sort of semi-wild spider monkeys in cage two at Arcus was that um, I was continually being called upon to perform the very notion of the human or the very figure of the human that I was critiquing, which was a sort of dominant, aggressive, distinct human that was trying to like police the boundaries between myself and the monkey. And the monkeys actually had to prove themselves as subordinate to the human in order to be eligible for release, right? To show their fear made them eligible to be released. So there's an interesting, maybe I'm just thinking about this as I speak, but there's an interesting way that in order to 
eventually live a wild life, like in the canopy, free from an enclosure, the monkeys had to show themselves as subordinate or as in a relationship which we might not think of as a, a relationship of wildness. So they had to be adept at living in an enclosure, but also show themselves as resisting that enclosure. So it's a very complicated, a very paradoxical relationship. But um, Rihanna Perenas, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing her name right. Yeah, She's sure written not. about this um, in the context of wildlife rehabilitation, that there's this sort of um, <clears throat> this desire to create autonomy in the animal, but it's through relations of forced dependence. Um, arrested autonomy, she calls it, right? Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure if that answers your question at all, just maybe to point to the ways that um, these overlapping socio and ecological networks, it's never, it's always fraught when they meet. And to find yourself in an embodied sort of mode of interacting in that space is quite intense. Um, even just to think back to my research on cougars that preceded the project about exotic pets, uh, I've never actually seen a cougar, even though they're more densely populated here on Vancouver Island than anywhere in North America. But I interviewed a lot of people who've had cougar encounters, and they sort of, for them, over and over, I heard like what an experience it was to be reduced to meat um, and to feel to feel as the subordinate object to this more dominant entity, which was the cougar. Um, so there's this, this sort of inescapable power dynamics to these meetings that I find really, really fascinating to think through. And just on that, Rosemary, could, I'd be really interested to hear more about your own sort of, I guess, embodied experience of kind of kind of the opposite in some ways of becoming dominant with these monkeys and how they actually felt. And, and I might piggyback on that uh, to bring in some of the classic literature on, on wildness. Mick Tausig from the 80s was, you know, shamanism, colonialism, and wild man. And, you know, you were basically as a caretaker being asked to embody the, the wild man or the wild woman and um, to mm -hmm. encourage that mimetic dance. Hmm. Yeah, um, I don't know. Actually, could you repeat your question again, the first part of the first question? Yeah, I was just interested in kind of that your actual, your embodied experience of becoming dominant with these, you know, you're right. saying that in order to be released, the monkeys had to be subordinate, and so. Yeah, yeah, yeah what thanks. What actually your experience of that? Thanks. I, you got a bit cut off the first time, so I didn't quite get all the words. Um, but that's a, it's a great question, both those questions together. Um, and uh, it, wasn't, it was with a lot of reluctance, I guess, that I, that I sort of became dominant. Um, especially, well, I mean, it's all, it, it, it feels bad. <laughs> it feels... Uh, like aggress it felt very sort of aggressive and uncomfortable and ambivalent. Um, there's this sort of act of doing something that you're being told is in the best interests of the animal but feels um, mean and, and mean-spirited. Uh, there were, especially, I mean, in a way, some of the monkeys, the monkeys all have their own personalities, right? So some, some of the monkeys were very reticent and were quite happy to just hang out at the very, as far away from us as they could get in the cage. And others were quite mischievous. Um, this one Stevie, who's a character that I write about in some of my work, um, was constantly seeking out interactions. And these could be partly as a product of a previous life as a pet or as a performer where, where he was actually encouraged to, to do those behaviors. Or it could just be a, a, a quirk of his personality, but he, you know, he would steal brushes and like scrub brushes, and he, he actually gave me a wedgie at one point. And <laughs> there are these moments of of hilarity, right? They're funny. They seem quite innocuous, actually. Even though the monkeys are are strong, it it feels playful. And and you had like I had to turn that moment into one of, like that deserved punishment. So to shout at the monkey and spray them, and um, they, they really don't like being sprayed. They would sort of cower when you sprayed them and like brush themselves off. Um, but there was, it's, it's, it's also kind of funny because um, maybe it speaks to the sort of repetitive nature of performances, that at first the, the performance, that performance of the human was 
was uncomfortable and awkward. And then as time went on, uh, the, rep the like repetitiveness of the performance started to make it seem sort of more natural or, or comfortable and until it's just sort of rote and routine, um, which is also kind of an interesting, an interesting thing. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it was a it was a real learning curve, and like I said, filled with ambivalence. <laughs> so, so one of the things I found in hanging out with monkeys uh, on the Silver River of Florida, a place where they're not supposed to be, is that uh, yeah, sometimes affects can become contagious. So. Uh, wild behavior, um, in this case on the part of uh, human boaters who like to feed the monkeys, um, sometimes results in um, these mimetic dances where, um, yeah, uh, situations spiral out of control and often uh, result in these asymmetrical um, situations of risk where um, the non-humans are, are exposed to the possibility of um, either acute bodily harm as a result of their contacts with people, maybe getting roughed up by a fellow monkey for transcending social norms within their own social group, or if there is um, a bite or violence towards a human, uh, the very possibility that not only that individual monkey, but that the whole population will be called and killed. And, and I'm wondering how such moments of becoming wild play out in, in this Arcus setting. It seems like, on the one hand, um, part of the teleology of becoming wild in that setting is, is precisely that kind of out-of-control behavior. That's what they're trying to cultivate on, on, on the one hand, although it, it, maybe that's the way they talk about it, but in actual practice it's, it's this subordinating process. So I'd just love to hear any stories about those contagious affects and wild becomings in, in the Arcus setting? Yeah, that's it's a great question. Um, there's a lot of different ways that that, that sort of <laughs> mimetic uh, interplay plays out. And it's not just with the monkeys. Like It, it, may, it reminds me that um, with the parrots, there's, act, there's a, a real risk of the parrots learning human speech if you talk to them. And at Arcus, it was a, a firm rule that you were not allowed to talk uh, when you're in the parrot cage because if the parrots learned even to say hola, uh, they wouldn't be released because there were fears that that sort of learned behavior would interfere with their ability to do meeting calls or to. Um, but it was sort of actually, I mean, I never really got like a very good explanation. I think it's partly tied to this idea that a human influence is polluting on the sort of natural integrity of the animal. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it was, I, I think that the thing that's tied to the wildness of the animal is this sort of interplay of encounterable and unencounterable, right? So there's this, um, alongside what um, Rihanna's idea of arrested autonomy, sort of making an animal autonomous through forced dependence, there's this idea of making unencounterable through very intimate encounters. Um, so there's, I mean, there's no escaping the proximity of the cage uh, and, it's, and the dependence of the animals on you as a human. Um, but the ultimate objective is to create an animal that is, out, like you said, I've been out of control and out of sight. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think of some actual specific instances of how this played out. Um, I mean, there were often escapes from cages uh, monkeys escaping, but there's such a series of sort of locks and cages that they could never get too far. The, so the, the the one thing to note, I guess, is that the moments of resistance or of wildness are so circumscribed in that space um, because of because of the because of not only um, human control or or like embodied control, but spatial control, right? The space of the cage. Um, there was one instance. Um, it was actually quite quite scary where I came too close to an adjacent cage which was filled with a monkey, a monkey troop that was a couple years older than the troop I was working with. So the troop I worked with was um, ju juveniles, three, four, two, three, four years old probably. Um, the, the, at that point they're, they're not quite as strong, they're not full grown, um, but the spider monkeys in the cage next, next door were older and much stronger and so volunteers were not allowed to work with them. It was only um, like 
Guatemalan workers who were paid, albeit not that well, but um, and had really risky jobs, would work with these monkeys. And so I came too, cl too close to the cage wall, and one of these monkeys actually reached through the cage and grabbed like my shoulders and my tank top strap and just started like yanking me back and forth where my head was flying back and forth like I, I and I could never have gotten away we were always have we always had to be in pairs in the cage so my um, co-worker came and sort of fought the monkey off um, and at that stage that sort of wild that wild display was not punished um, there's an idea that by that point the monkeys are sort of old enough and close enough to being released that their wildness is permissible. Um, but it was very scary. Um, and and it caused a stir <laughs> within the cage I was working in. Um, so we left the cage. When things got too out of control, we would just leave the cage. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's an anecdote that speaks to <laughs> anything that you're... And, and I think panning out, um, you know, we see that this is a historical moment when wild forms of life are increasingly caged, whether it's in a literal cage uh, with bars or um, caged by the encroachment of, uh, you know, capitalism in its various forms, whether it's houses for people or, or cropland for um, human foods. W w one, one of the, um, the first conversations we had this morning was about cryopolitics, the sort of modes of freezing life. Um, uh, that that happen under um, uh, current regimes of, of managing the world, and you know, par partially that we were talking about the literal freezing that happens when you put endangered species on ice or um, freeze humans with the idea that they one day might be reanimated. But it seems like wildlife is being caged and frozen um, on a landscape scale, maybe, and. Um, yeah, maybe I'd like to hear you um, talk a little bit about wildness on a landscape scale and um, what what wildness means in this moment where um, the landscape is dominated by 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 humans and, and our infrastructure. Well, I think yeah. I mean, the for me that that spatial aspect that may, maybe what you're calling the landscape level. Conceptualization of wildness is is incredibly critical. Maybe the maybe the most critical. Um, that might be because maybe an, an earlier origin story of how I came to think about wildness is through the research I did on cougars. Um, so you have a situation on Vancouver Island where um, cougars have always been quite plentiful, but actually it was clear cutting, which then creates a, a very abundant sort of very uh, forest floor, or not forest floor, but just vegetation, uh, which draws a lot of deer, and then in turn draws a lot of cougars. It, it was it was that sort of cycle or pr progression that led to this situation of of you know hundreds of cougars on on an island that's that's not very big. Um, and I talked to some wildlife biologists along the course of my research, and their sort of general message was that cougars need respect and they need space. And so it, it really made me start to think through what a spatial politics of wildness would look like in terms of how we plan communities, um, what we, what we like, it's, it's sort of another, adding another layer to the terra nullius sort of conception, like how, how we think of certain lands as, as empty and how that was tied to colonialism and the evacuation of indigenous people from land, but now how wild animals are, well, have always been, but are continue to be also evacuated uh, from those lands. Um, and, I mean, absolutely the sort of expansion of the suburbs and cities into those lands are circumscribing that spatial requirement that, that cougars have in abundance, but that many animals also have. Um, so, so thinking through enclosure not only in terms of as you said, as an actual literal cage, but as a sort of imp impinging um, in spatial forms on the requirements for a, a lively life. Um, 
Yeah, that's a the, the cougar example is the one that comes to mind. Maybe just because I'm I'm on Vancouver Island right now. <laughs> um, I'm just also interested, Rosemary, in the I, I love what you said about the um, making an encounterable. I thought that was a really lovely phrase, and um. So the hedgehogs that I've been, I've been working with people who are involved in hedgehog conservation in the UK and definitely I would say those folks are thinking about hedgehogs as wild but they're also really deeply encounterable. You know, people are seeing them every day in their backyards um, and I guess, you know, hedgehogs got the night, maybe people have got the day so you have to maybe give a little bit of effort to encounter a hedgehog but certainly they are both wild and encounterable as are I guess the badgers and the foxes which are also now in cities like Bristol. Um, but I was really interested in so your example of the serval as well and people making space for wildness in urban spaces and I guess generally I was wondering about your thoughts about wildness in the urban and so encounterable wildness but also the the serval like what do you think is going to happen to her or him? Uh, great question. Um, space for wildness in the urban I think that's a really exciting sort of move underway these days in some cities to, to do that um, and and I think what it speaks for me what it speaks to is the importance of avoiding like a one size fits all ethical approach to animals, right? So the the reason why I've sort of um, I've been my work's been in tension with a sort of more Harrowian concept of ethics being cultivated through encounter, right? Through face to face meetings, like in when species meet, she's quite clear that this is a this is a productive site for like a, a generate the generation of, of an ethic towards animals. Um, there are some animals for which or for whom this is completely uh, welcome and possible and can lead to mutual flourishing, I think, like dogs in Haraway's case, or like squirrels or badgers, neighbors, maybe, where, where the, the discomfort of encounter is pretty minor, maybe a little bit of property damage, or and, and accommodations can be made to coexist pretty nicely. Um, there are a lot of other species for whom it's not possible, um, and cougars, again, are a perfect example. Cougars and humans do not meet well, and in fact, the sign of a healthy relationship with cougars is that you do not encounter each other. Um, they don't particularly want to encounter us, and most people don't want to encounter them. Um, so I think, I think it's important to keep wildness the, as a state of being divorced from whether or not an animal is encounterable. But it, there may be some cases where unencounterability is, if not a prerequisite for wildness, is a, an important condition for it, and in other cases that may not be the case at all. Um, as for this serval, I'm, I'm really quite torn myself. I'm, I'm, the chances of it being able to survive here on its own are Science would tell us, biology would tell us that the chances are pretty slim. I'm not sure if that's actually the case, so I'm kind of on side with the idea of letting it <laughs> give it a try. Um, people would have to be pretty responsible with putting their chickens away at night and keeping their cats in, indoors. Um, if it gets captured, it will be returned to its owner. Um, and it has apparently a, a bit of an outdoor enclosure and an indoor enclosure. The people say that servals are that people some like pet owners call them domesticated, but clearly on a genetic level they aren't. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens. I mean, it is kind of like a an ongoing saga. Um, I think some people are pretty worried about it being loose, and so would like it to be caught. But personally, I don't know. I kind of love love the idea <laughs> of it being being out there trotting along. Uh, finding its own way. So, so there's a mystery monkey of St. Petersburg uh, who was on the loose, part of this probably same population of, of rhesus macaques in the Silver River. And it, it, it got uh, 81,000 Facebook fans. So I bet if you started a Facebook page for the <laughs> circle, it would, it would get a similar following. Um, but I wanted to ask you one, one final question, and this is related to uh, Sarah Franklin's uh, really provocative distinction um, between the old forms of wildness, as in you know, wild boar or wild goose, 
which are imagined as being outside of regimes of, of domestication or cultivation or human control. And then the new forms of wildness that are emerging within the most intensive sites of, yeah. of domestication, the, the biotech initiatives. So um, a, a lot of the artists featured in the multi-species salon book um, ask us to not think of these new things as, as monstrous beings that um, are going to sort of take over and destroy the world, as, as you see in a lot of the science fiction scenarios about these new forms of wildness, but to think about these creatures as needy of care, as things that we've created and have responsibility to. And, and I was just wondering what your thoughts are on, on these new forms of, of wildness that are emerging. It, it has echoes of Latour with his, uh, we should take care of our technologies as our children. Mm. Yeah, um, I, I, it seems to me that, again, it's important to have a sort of variegated approach, um, that there are, there are modes of, obviously, modes of the bioscientific enterprise that are worth resisting deeply um, for their sort of intensification of like managerialism and, and human control. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think that absolutely that once sort of, once these experiments are underway and have produced these sort of entities that we, that we absolutely have a responsibility to care for them. It's just, I think that, that the important thing to sort of continue to remind ourselves of all the way along is that um, we're, we're pretty good at taking responsibility until it actually begins to seriously impinge on on our sort of our, our own freedoms, human freedom, the, or you know, accumulation. Um, so that that might that that's something to continue to keep in mind is that that, that actually being responsible and, and accommodating some of these monstrous entities might mean taking a hit. <laughs> In some in some way or another, um, it's hard to speak about in the abstract. I think, but yeah, there's there's critters all around us now. So uh, just for example, I know in the Santa Cruz Mountains, there's all sorts of transgenic fruit flies on the loose with uh, mm. a glowing cytoplasm that uh, has uh, a green fluorescing protein from jellyfish in them, and wow. um, others that have glowing sperm for a particular experiment that I learned about. Um, so yeah, these these things are going wild all around us. Um, and and another side of, of sort of curation and collection and inventorying is um, Rich Pell's Museum of Post Natural History in Pittsburgh, which I had the pleasure of visiting about three weeks ago. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's 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 a new form of wildness, and um, much work remains to be done in, in terms of both chronicling what's emerging and thinking clearly and critically about. Um, yeah, both the the monstrosities um, that uh, we are entangled with and, and co-creating and caring for, um, but yeah, may, maybe seeing some as hopeful monsters. To recycle a phrase from Stephen Jay Gould, what what sort of what sort of odd hopes might we pin on on these monsters that are emerging in our midst? <laughs> I guess it's sort of like monstrous, monstrous according to whom, right? Is part of the question, right. yeah. um, and then also recognizing that 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 attempts to control will always, I think, will always generate escape and new forms of wildness. Um, so how how you respond to that is the critical question, I guess. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and I think it's somewhere between the 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 absolute panic of a lot of these science fiction novels and. Um, and also the the technophilic celebration of of the singularity that's rushing towards this 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 future, and it's it's that um, ambivalent middle ground I think that we're we're exploring as as ethnographers and geographers. Um, so so thank you for giving us a, a keyword for grappling with that that wild <laughs> zone of, of emergence. <laughs> it was really my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. And very well said that last bit about that middle ground. <laughs> Nailed it. Okay, thanks. We'll, we'll be in touch. All right, bye. 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 <laughs>